Our next speaker is Joyce Cow. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about some work that I've been doing as postdoc in the Siegel Lab on cryptic genetic variation in Drosophila melanogaster. The arrow keys are not working up here. Oh, oh do I have to signal to you to change the slides? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'd like to start off with first defining what cryptic genetic variation is, um, or CGV for short. So for the purposes of this exercise, um, let's consider this uh, population of hypothetical animals, which is who are probably endemic to this Orlando area. Um, in particular, let's, con let's uh, consider this individual in the middle with uh, this genome. And I've highlighted here in blue, which is um, the standing variation in this genome, which under normal circumstances um, doesn't do anything in terms of a, uh, the phenotype of the organism. However, um, these cryptic variants um, can be, not yet, <laughs> can be revealed if we um, perturb the system and one type of perturbation that we can cause um, is a uh, external perturbation which would be the environment now. Okay. <laughs> which can cause some uh, cryptic variants to be revealed to show a new phenotype. <laughs> Alright, so the second type of perturbation is an internal perturbation such as a mutation in the genome. Um, and some variants can react to this uh, mutation and create a new type of phenotype. I feel like I'm dancing up here. Okay. So, <laughs> it should go without saying that cryptic genetic variation can influence evolutionary outcomes. So, under normal circumstances, can you see the mouse? Oh, yay. Okay. Um, in this population, you have a certain range of phenotypes, and when we perturb this population, uh, what should have, what cryptic genetic variation um, should do is um, increase the variation of these phenotypes in this population. Okay, so we know that there are many studies, uh, or there have been many studies done um, in terms of looking at cryptic genetic variants revealed by external perturbations. Um, I've borrowed this figure from a recent review paper to illustrate two examples. So in the top panel here, um, we have two sibling tadpoles and they were fed different diets um, to create these two very different body morphologies. Um, in these bottom three panels, um, the example is the uh, dung fly. Uh, and then when these dung flies are raised at different temperatures, females can develop uh, varying numbers of um, sperm storage organs or spermatheci. Okay, so while there are tons of studies looking at uh, cryptic genetic variation revealed by G by E interactions, there are not as many um, studies done looking at cryptic variants revealed by uh, genetic perturbations. Um, and the studies that have been done have been done in multiple species, and within one species have been done in um, multiple genetic backgrounds, or different genetic backgrounds between studies. Now this makes it really difficult to draw any overall conclusions about cryptic genetic variation um, in terms of how prevalent it is in nature and how and what mechanisms it acts upon when it's revealed. So what we've done in the Siegel Lab is we've developed a systematic way to study cryptic genetic variation um, using a standardized panel of uh, Drosophila flies. So the panel that we're using is the ever popular Drosophila Genetic Reference Panel or DGRP for short. These are publicly available, and it consists of over 200 uh, wild-derived isogenic Drosophila melanogaster lines. And one really great thing about this resource is that all of the lines have been fully sequenced, so we know the variants associated with each line. So the gene that we want to cause a perturbation in, or our genetic perturbation, uh, is HIS2AV. Uh, this gene is on the third chromosome and encodes for an alternate histone. And we chose it um, partially because in our lab, previously, uh, other members have studied the uh, ortholog in yeast, the, uh, which is HTZ1, and we've, it's been shown to confer robustness in cell morphology against microenvironmental variation. 
Um, additionally, there have been studies in nematode worms and as well as more yeast studies uh, showing that um, chromatin regulation uh, contributes to the suppression of cryptogenetic variation. So it stands to reason that if we perturb his 2 avian flies, we should be able to reveal some cryptic variation. However, there's some caveats working with his 2 av um, First of all, uh, homozygous mutants do not live past the larval stage. Um, so to look at phenotypes in adults, at least, we have to look at heterozygous mutants. But there, it doesn't, uh, currently there doesn't exist a um, true knockout of his 2 av that's dominantly tagged so that we can track it in heterozygous mutants. So what we did is we created our own. Um, so we made a GFP his 2 av knockout. Uh, in a standard yellow-white uh, lab strain, which is depicted here in purple. And we did this by using homologous, homologous recombination uh, and replacing the HIS2AV gene in the lab background uh, with this uh, white neo uh, con uh, fusion gene. And this white neo gene is really nifty because um, this homologous recombination event of replacing this gene is very rare. And normally you'd have to screen through tens of thousands of flies to get the right knockout candidate, um, but uh, the white neogene allows us to do a two-fold selection process where we can select on red eyes, and then we can use G418, which is a neomycin, to select against flies who do not have this, con who have this gene knocked in. So after we have this white neo uh, gene in the place of HIS2AV, we can s add in a, using this, uh, the at P and at B sites on this construct, uh, a GFP gene. And then we can take out the white neo gene using these LOX P sites uh, here. And so um, in the end, what we're left with is a uh, lab, a yellow white lab strain with um, his 2 av replaced by a GFP gene, which we can easily track. So now the challenge is to get this um, GFP tagged his 2 av knockout into the backgrounds of the 200 plus um, uh, DGRP lines. Um, and so here I'm showing, uh, so we do this through a series of crosses, and here I'm only showing what's happening on a third chromosome because in the first few crosses we can replace all of the lab chromosome, all of the lab sex chromosomes and other autosomes with DGRP background using this crossing scheme um, and balancer chromosomes. So um, then we're left with this fly here that is all DGRP, except for this one third chromosome that uh, has our GFP tagged his 2 av knockout. And then we replace the lab background here also in purple, um, slowly with DGRP background using 15 generations of integration crosses. So we back cross, so we select for females with this GFP mutation um, and we back cross them to uh, DGRP males for 15 generations. So this takes quite a while, and we did this for all 200 plus lines. <laughs> um, but in reality, at the end of this process, we were uh, only about 150 of them survived after the 15 generations of back crossing. So now that we created a, um, his, a GFP tagged his 2 av knock, uh, knockout in all of the DGRP lines, um, we need to have a, have a way to reveal the cryptic genetic variation in the system. Um, so the way that we do that is we cross uh, these uh, mutant DGRP lines, to, uh, males, uh, to this white model four line uh, tester strain. And now this white model four line is special because on the X chromosome, there's an inversion that puts the white gene near pericentric heterochromatin. So therefore, chromatin state is, actually, is very important in terms of um, whether or not this white gene is expressed and red, red pigment is uh, made in the eye cell. So, you, because, uh, so these white model four flies have this um, uh, phenotype where some of the, uh, this variegated eye phenotype where some of the eye cells have, um, are expressing red pigment and some are, express, are not expressing the red pigment. So we um, do these crosses and we can create these males where we can see also this um, position effect variegation or PEV um, phenotype um, in the males. And we can create males that have uh, both the HIS2AV perturbation and without the perturbation from this one cross. So after we collect all the males from each condition, from all the lines, um, 
they uh, quickly take a bath in liquid nitrogen and a ride on the vortexer, and we collect all their heads, and we put them painstakingly on these um, pins to make flyhead skewers. So then we can take these skewers and um, rotate them under the scope and take pictures of the left and right eye of the heads. And we, we end up with these images that we can put through Fiji, which is a free image processing software. Um, using some filters, we can um, actually quantify the amount of red pigment that's um, in the white eyes. Um, so that would be the, the position, that, that would be the phenotype that we would uh, use for a further analysis. Um, so to analyze the amount of position effect, or to analyze the position effect variegation, uh, we can use a, a linear mixed model, uh, which was developed by a previous grad student in the lab, uh, where they take, where he takes um, the variance of line by, uh, from line by genotype, and we can partition the variance into line spreading uh, and line crossing, um, or variance attributed to line spreading and line crossing. Um, in the case of line spreading is where uh, we would be able to uh, measure how much um, cryptic genetic variation is revealed. Now, since we're in the middle of still collecting all our data, um, we don't quite have this analysis yet, but what we have is quite promising um, because we do see from the flies that we've made so far is that different genetic backgrounds have very distinct responses when we knock out HIS2AB. Uh, for example, this top line, DGRP number 383, doesn't seem to care very much when we take out a copy of HIS2AB. However, uh, this bottom line, uh, which is DGRP32, um, seems to care quite a bit. So today I've shown you that we created a GFP tagged, tagged uh, HIS2AV knockout. Um, we've integrated this knockout into the uh, about 150 DGRP lines. Uh, and then I'm currently tweaking the pipeline for an image-based analysis of the um, of position effect variegation for uh, the phenotype we're looking at. Um, I should add that um, we're happy to share any of these um, knockouts that we've made if anybody's interested. And because we've painstakingly made all of these knockouts, we have corresponding second and third chromosome balancer lines for most of the DGRP, which we will also be happy to share. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, all the people who made this project um, possible. Um, all the, these are all the fly people, previous and uh, present fly people in the lab uh, who have been really, really awesome in um, helping with all the lab work. <laughs> and of course, um, most of the, I guess, heavy lifting was done by a lot of our um, Siegel Lab fly undergrads who are here. Um, here's the yeast section of the Siegel Lab who uh, were very helpful in um, having scientific discussions. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the NSF and NIH to, uh, for funding to make everything possible. And with that, I'd like uh, to take questions if you have any. We have time for a question. Don't everybody rush to the microphone. There's one. <laughs> so I'm curious about the, these, um, these 50 or 54 lines that you couldn't make. Can you speak up? I can't. For, for these lines, that you, there were about a quarter of the lines where you couldn't integrest the here deletion allele, uh -huh. right? So, so are those all synthetic lethals with your H2AZ? Or, or are there some of those other things going on? Have you looked at them at all? So you're asking for the 50 lines that didn't make it, what happened? Yeah. Well. We don't really know. They just weren't. <laughs> yeah. so, so you haven't looked at them in any detail to try and uh, figure out what's really going on? We didn't really look at exactly why they didn't survive. Um, it could be like hybrid dysgenesis or something weird or kooky, but we designed the crosses in a way where that shouldn't happen. But, I mean. Thanks. No problem. <laughs>